Okay, well, thank you, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this paper or chapter is really a commentary on the current climate change negotiations and the role China could play in rescuing. I don't want to abuse my position by commenting on Yongsheng's paper just to avoid any confusion. The way I see it, he's, he's offering a model for, for long term mitigation uh, out to 2050, and, and I'm concerned with the current negotiations today on how we might get to uh, 2020. But that's one way to think about it. That could be a topic for discussion. Uh, if we look at the current climate change negotiations, they're really about how to go from 2012, which is when the Kyoto Treaty basically expires, to 2020. And there are three main propositions around which current negotiations are structured. These are the three that were agreed at the Bali conference in December 2007, and recently reiterated at the Major Economies Forum uh, just last week. The widespread continuing agreement around these propositions uh, has caught observers by surprise, or at least me by surprise, I think it was reasonable to think that when America came back into the climate change negotiations this year, they might change the, try to change the terms of the negotiations, but that didn't happen. And so the Bali roadmap uh, continues to, uh, to guide the negotiations. As I said, it, it can be boiled down to three propositions. The first is that developed countries should commit to binding emission reduction targets, as they already have, but for, under Kyoto for a subsequent period. <coughs> The second is that developing countries should undertake policies and measures to reduce emissions below what they would otherwise have been. And the third is that uh, the developed world should support the developing world in this endeavour, principally by the supply of finance. So this is a different model to the Kyoto Protocol, which was really a world in which only the developed countries took actions. Under the Bali Roadmap, everyone acts, or at least major economies act, but different metrics are used to measure this action in the developed and developing world. Targets for developed world, <coughs> policies for developing, sorry, targets for developed countries, policies for developing countries. And thus the cherished principle of common but differentiated responsibility is upheld, even if in a, in a rather, rather messy way. But in any case, I'm not here to defend the Bali roadmap. It's uh, far from optimal. But it is the current, in fact, it's the only game in town, so we can't ignore it either. I said there's an agreement around these three propositions. But by that I only mean uh, agreement that these should be the negotiating framework. There's a lack of agreement uh, within each proposition, and that's why the negotiations aren't going very well. So we can go through them one by one. On the first, most developed countries have now put forward reduction targets for 2020. Um, 1990s common use of the baseline for these. And my assessment is that the offer so far in the range of 10 to 20 percent reduction by 1990. Developing countries think that isn't enough. They think that developed countries should go in the range of 25 to 40 percent, and recently they've sort of hardened that to always stress the upper end of that bound of 40 percent. On financing, the third point, there's also a large gulf. Developing countries ask for lots of money, hundreds of billions, to support their mitigation. They want to develop, delivered primarily through government channels. Developed countries, on the other hand, stress the role of the markets in delivering carbon finance are reluctant to commit public funds and overall tend to downplay the need for international funding. But I would add, in this area, there have been some very positive initiatives uh, recently, in particular a speech by Gordon Brown, uh, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. And perhaps there is, we see a belated recognition by the rich countries they will need to put significant volumes of public funding on the table if they want to see a deal. I put the second plank, developing country uh, policies last, because here there's less of a gulf than uh, simply confusion. What sort of policies developing countries might commit to, how they will register that commitment, what these policies will add up to, uh, this, or, this remains, even at this stage, you know, very unclear, just a few months out from Copenhagen. But this is where China could come in. China, of course, has enormous influence. It's the world's largest emitter. It's been responsible for most of the recent rapid global growth in emissions. It's a superpower. And importantly, China is yet to show its hand. China has, despite having registered very rapid emissions growth in uh, uh, this decade, uh, China has put in place over the last few years a number of policies and targets to improve energy efficiency and diversify its energy sources. It now has a target to improve energy efficiency, that's the ratio of energy to output, by 20% by 2010, and a renewable energy target of 15% uh, by 2020. But 2010 is only one year away, and China is thinking about targets for the next five-year plan, which runs from 2011 to 2015. There's a lot of analysis, uh, commentary, speculation that I try to summarize in the, in the chapter. Uh, that China might extend its current uh, policy targets. Perhaps China might announce a target 
of halving its energy intensity, that is doubling its energy efficiency, relative to 2005 by 2020. Perhaps China might go further and combine its renewable energy target and its energy efficiency target into an emissions intensity target. That is, have a target the ratio of greenhouse gas emissions to GDP and aim to halve that by 2020 relative to 2005. So we know that China's thinking along these lines and we know that it will shortly announce new domestic targets. And we also know from the anticipatory response of the US that such a, a target uh, would be seen as, as ambitious. And my own analysis in the chapter uh, certainly confirms that uh, such a target, a target along the lines of halving <coughs> emissions intensity by 2020 would be difficult to achieve, <coughs> likely not be achieved without further policy effort. And one reason we know that is the difficulties China is having in meeting its current target, which is that 20% reduction in energy intensity by 2010. China's only really started to have success uh, with regard to that target last year, and that was because that's because of the global downturn. Uh, not really because of policy effort, but because the global downturn hit energy intensive industries in China particularly hard. Uh, so the policy uh, uh, along uh, halving emissions intensity policy would be uh, seen as, uh, meeting as, as meeting the ambition test. The real question is then whether China would be prepared to table this policy internationally.